Our guest today is John Vroman. He's the founder of Front Row Dads, and he founded Front Row Dads because he wanted to win at home and not just at work. Over the last five years, Front Row Dads has become a diverse group of over 230 dads from 12 different countries who share a common bond of choosing to put family first as they grow their businesses. The mission of Front Row Dads is to help men deepen their connection with their children and build a family legacy that they're proud of. Outside of the podcast, live events, and online summits, Front Row Dads has a highly engaged membership that supports each dad in aligning with his family values and staying committed to the most important people in his life. John Broman is a fantastic human being. He runs an incredible community. Uh, He is um, uh, someone I would consider a mentor of many. Uh, He has an awesome podcast uh, I encourage you to check out. And he has a fantastic book called The Front Row Factor. So get ready for an unbelievable conversation with founder of the Front Row Foundation, Front Row Dads, Mr. John Vroman. So welcome back to the Better Than Rich show. We have an unbelievable guest today, and I'm really excited to introduce you to John Vroman. He's a husband, father, founder of the Front Row Dads community and the brotherhood that's created family men with businesses versus businessmen with families. John Broman, welcome to the Better Than Rich show, brother. Fellas, it's good to be here. We're excited to have you. And uh, I just want to say I absolutely loved your book, The Front Row Factors. So listeners, everyone watching on YouTube, highly recommend picking it up. And obviously, we could go in a lot of different directions uh, with with you, and we're, we're going to take you on a whole journey. I, I absolutely loved so much from the book, so much from your podcast, your guests, your community, the Front Row Foundation, how much you've done for humanity. And I want to start with one thing you talked about in the book. At 29 years old, you sat down with your journal and you wrote, what does my ideal life look like in all different categories? Health, family, friends, spiritual, financial contribution. This was kind of at a point in your life where you were working with Cutco. That's how I remember you. That's how I knew you. You had what you called in the book, like your dream job. You were a moment maker for this direct sales company. And you had like this awesome life. You're traveling the world. You're experiencing a lot of cool things. You know, you, you have a lot of really great things happening for you and to you. But yet you sat down with your journal. You went through this exercise. And now you fast forward from that con- from that conversation with yourself, you've built some beautiful things. Can you just kind of take us back to that moment and like, what was it? What, who was John then versus now? Like, yeah. what's transpired from that? What did all this look like for you, man? Mm. Well, it's such a fun question to reflect upon, and and likely because we have so many years now to look back and go, oh, the dot connecting makes sense. But in that moment, you're just doing the best you can with what you have, and you're not quite sure how it's going to all unfold. And what I remember about that time in my life was that yes, I had like land, I was in my dream job, and there were so many things that were going well. Um, and yet there was a, there was a piece of my life that wasn't really fulfilled. And that was how I was giving and contributing. And right about that time is when I had the idea to start front row foundation, which is what led to the front row factor book and man, building a charity and raising money and doing good with my friends was pure joy. It was so invigorating, so powerful. And it pushed us all in really cool, unique ways. You know, it used to be like we would party, but we'd party without a real purpose, a a genuine purpose. And then we're throwing galas and 400 people are showing up and we're raising lots of money and putting people in the front row of their favorite event. You know, people that had life-threatening illnesses and we're meeting the families and I just, what I felt was this rich purpose in my life. And I was so proud of the work that we were doing because lots of things that I had done in my life prior to that were very selfish and, and, uh, you know, not proud moments, you know, not, not my best, you know, was put forth in the world. And this felt like a time when I was really stepping into a new version of me. But interestingly, if you fast forward a little bit, is all that good at a dark side too? And here's what it was. I mean, part of that, part of the dark side was I was giving because I wanted to feel like I mattered. I was giving because I wanted to feel like I was enough. And if you're not sourcing that from within, 
that can be a very, uh, it can be a hungry ghost type situation, right? And that can be really, really challenging because I was, I was insatiable, my need to feel important to people. And here's what ended up happening. We ended up raising millions of dollars with the charity. We were doing lots of great work, wrote a book about it, speaking all over the world about, you know, living life in the front row. And so many things were great. But what was happening in the background, and I, I really mean the background, was that I was raising a family. I had a six-year-old and a one-year-old at one point, you know, six, it's 2016. And I have a, you know, and, 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 and here's what's, here's what's happening. Um, is that, is that right? To th- uh, let me think about the timeline of this. Yeah. So I, I, ma- I landed my biggest speaking gig ever. Right. And I'm talking an obscene amount of money for one hour speech. And I'm at the height of my career. And my wife comes to me and she says, in a very vulnerable, very loving moment, is this like, you're more of a moment maker for everybody else than you are for your own family. Mm. And I needed to hear that because I was so busy out trying to like show my kids how to, how to work hard and how to give and how to be important in the world. I wanted to be a good example, but in doing so, I was also ignoring them at home. And so that's what led to ultimately front row dads. And that's what led me to the work that I'm doing today. But it has mm-hmm. been a roller coaster of like the highest of highs. And then realizing that all those bright spots can create shadows that, unless you address, can cause a lot of pain for people too. Well, I yeah. mean, John, that's, that's amazing, man. I, mean, I love the, the vulnerability. And I think, you know, for every business leader listening, uh, evaluate, right? How much time are you spending with your family and, and how much attention are they actually getting? Uh, not just time, but quality time. Are you on the phone? Are you distracted? Uh, so it's just great insight. And I think that 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 goes to what your hat says, right? Which yeah, is being yeah. a, a, a family man, right? With a business instead of a businessman with a family. That's right. uh, and that's one of your mantras. Um, speak to that a little bit. What, what does that mean to you? And, um, sure. you know, being a front row dad, what does that mean to be a front row dad? Yeah, well, literally, when you, well, Front Row Foundation always was about putting people in the front row of their favorite event. That led to this philosophy of living life in the front row. So what does that really mean? Well, it means like getting close to the people, places, and thoughts and things that make you come alive. Like you've heard people say proximity is power, right? And, and so can we get really close to those things that we want to be lit up by, that we want to pour energy into? And, and, and over the years, of course, there was a fair share of people who are like, I don't want to be in the front row. I want to be on the field playing the game. And you're like, yes. And... There are moments in life when you don't have to be the star. You don't have to be the one on the field. You can shine the light on someone else. You can put them on stage and, you know, give them the love and let them have a moment in the spotlight. And that's what being in the front row is all about. It's a, it's a wonderful relationship between the performer and the person in the front row and this, and this beautiful energy that's created when we, when we can look at somebody and love on them and respect what they're doing. And as a father, that's a lot of what you're doing. You're putting your kids on the field. You are there cheering them on and being in the front row. I mean, look, it's not always great to be in the front row. I went to a concert, you know, recently and I it was, went to Rufus DeSoul with my, my wife and a bunch of friends. And the deal is like, dude, I'm looking at the front row going, I don't want to be there. <laughs> I don't, I do not in this moment want to be in the front row. And there's of course, great perspective that you get from being in the back row. But the point is that if we can step up if we can get close to our families, if we can be in that space, you know, that's really what it's about. And when you look at your calendar, when you look at where you're investing your time, your money, your energy, your resources, like where is it all going? And if you can't prove it on your calendar, then it, it might bring up a question of like, hey, do I need to make some, do I need to rearrange a few things here? And that's where the priorities come into play. Look, we all want to win in business. I want to win in business. I would like to make millions of dollars in my life. I would like to help other people make millions of dollars. I would like to have a beautiful home and a nice car and all the things. I want my kids to go to great schools. I want to travel the world. These things take money, but I don't want to sacrifice my family in the pursuit of more, in the pursuit of success at work, in hiding at work, which is what a lot of business guys do. They're like, I'm going to go work hard and show my family how to do it. And the truth is deep inside, even if it's at a subconscious level, they're like, 
because because being at work is a lot easier than being at home, right? It's a lot easier in many ways. They're rock stars. Maybe they're leaders. Maybe people jump when they say that, you know, hey, it's time to go. And there's a lot of respect. And if people don't listen, they fire them. You know, like there's so much power in that space. Um, and at home, sometimes, you know, you're like, hey, would you take out the trash? And they're like, boo, dad. And you're like, I can't fire you. And you won't listen. Ah, you know, so... Anyway, yeah. I love it. <laughs> at, at what point did you transition? Because you went from this creating these moment makers and and helping these individuals in the front line to kind of helping dads uh, in the business. Like, yeah. how did that? How did that transition? Like, where did that show up for you? Was it like this one epiphany moment that you had? Is like I got to help these men. Or? Yeah. It's kind of slowly and then all at once, you know, for like it happens for many people. So like I, it was in 2016, it was on my radar that I needed to be a better dad. I got the guys together and here's what happened. I lost energy gradually over time for doing this, the speeches and traveling and being away in another city that became very lackluster to me. And front row dads is growing, just naturally growing 50 guys and a hundred guys and 150 guys. And I'm like, wait a minute, I can literally just do front row dads. And right at the end of 2019, we had a hundred and some guys in the group and then the world shut down. And I was like, there is no better time to serve men and their families than right now. Like, we're going to do it. We're going to go all in. And in that moment, I immediately said yes to front row dads, no to everything else. And then I remember having that moment with the charity where I mean, look, the charity is my heart. I'd been working on it for a decade. We, you know, I, I loved it. My identity was wrapped up in it. But I remember I was sitting in a hotel room in Florida with one of my best friends in the world who you know, know John Kane. And I'm talking to him and I'm just having this epiphany in the moment that I have come to an end with Front Row Foundation as its leader. And that I needed to hand that over. And that was very hard because I, so much of my identity was wrapped up in it. I was like, how do I not do that? But I did. And I stepped away from the board. I stepped away from any type of leadership position. And I handed that off to a group of very talented people who are doing a great job with Front Row Foundation today. But I'm not involved uh, in, the, in the operations. I'm a donor. I help raise money occasionally. But, uh, but I, I decided that I was going to be Front Row Dads and Family, those two things. And that became my priority. And I'm glad I did. It was a hard decision, but I'm really grateful. There's there's so many unbelievable stories in the book of how many people were recipients of, of mm. these donations. I mean, you said you raised millions of dollars uh, and the stories are incredible. Uh, favorite rock concert or a sporting event. And, you know, some so of them, cool. um, you know, passed away. Some of them didn't. And, and, and the memories are still there. And like being able to keep yeah. to, to, to be able to keep that alive beyond you, I think is what a lot of a lot of men, I, I could say a lot of people in general, but I could speak on behalf of myself and men I've interacted with. They have this direction, this purpose that they want to leave the world better than they found it. And they want to leave yeah. this legacy and have this. And for you to be able to build something so beautiful that is life changing for so many and then step away from it, pass the baton to the next, you know, people mm. in charge. If you had to give any insight to a listener, if they wanted to model something like that, to build something from the ground up, make it beautiful, help so many people, and then kind of like fade to the background and let somebody else take over. What, what might you say to someone who, who has that passion? Um, great question, man. Uh, let me, I'll answer that in a second. I want to tell you a victory, by the way, that as you were talking about the charity and like the people that we helped, I was driving my 13 year old to school the other day. And what happened that prompted this? I don't remember what happened. We were watching one of the old Front Row Foundation videos where we sent a, a woman to go see Jimmy Buffett and Jeff Bry, who's a Cutco legend, was actually the host of that event. And we were talking about her experience at a, at a Cutco event and Tiger, my 13 year old's watching the video as I'm driving into school. And dude, I got teary eyed thinking about my son being able to witness this and see this at his age where I am very proud of the work that we have done. So I think that if somebody has a calling in their heart to go do something for people, they should do it. And along the way, they need to pay attention to how much they're giving 
in service and how much they're giving to themselves and to their families. And just pay attention to that because it is going to be periods where you'll go all in on the charity and then you need to like pump the brakes and come back to the family. And if you're present and witnessing what's happening in your life, then you can be agile and make quick adjustments, right? That's the goal. But here's where I think it begins, Mike, is I believe that when a person wants to give, my framework was you start by asking, what's your greatest love and your greatest fear? And you start there. What do you love? Where, where are you naturally drawn? You know, what, where does your energy go up? right? And what are you most fear? Because the moving towards and away is where we get a lot of energy in life, right? We'll work really hard to have something not happen, right? And we'll also work really hard to have something happen if we want it bad enough. So if you get clear about those things. So for me, my greatest fear was actually getting to the end of my life and not doing the things that I wanted to do, not having the experiences I wanted to have, like a wasted life where I didn't go after it with everything I had. That was my greatest fear, a wasted life. And that however many years I would have, however many years I was gifted, right? And then my greatest love was magic moments. And so you started to see a theme here, right? Like you started to see a theme of like, who, who, what do you naturally move towards? Who is your community? What do they care about? What do I care about? Where's the energy? That's the question. Where's the energy? That's the question I want people to walk away with. Like if there's one thing in this podcast that I hope people feel and I hope they take away is where's the energy? I think this whole game, this whole life, it's an energy play. I think this whole life, Mike, is a a dance and dance is an energy exchange. I like it more now to think of life as a dance than I do a game because games are often like winning and losing. And I think that competitiveness can be really great, but I like to think of it more like a dance. And there might be one person leading and another person following and some people watching and you have to determine like and agree on what dance are we doing and dance can be so expressive. And by the way, you're I, this is coming from a guy who if you'd have asked me one month ago, I would have told you, I hate dancing. I hate it with a passion. Every part of my being hates it. My wife's like, let's go dancing. I'm like, no. But I had this incredible experience at Burning Man a couple weeks ago. And yeah, I've talked about it all on on my podcast about like my breakthrough with dance and how that happened. And this, this is like an epiphany for me now. But that's an energy thing, right? And if you're paying attention to the energy, if you're in sync with the rhythm of your surroundings and your environment and what's inside of you and outside of you, and you put that together and you're in flow with that, that's a beautiful place to operate from. And I think that's where people are striking gold constantly is when they're in that state of flow and they're in the dance, you know, and that's to me the best part. Oh, can I share one quick story, by the way? On this Please. note, run quick story. So we're at the we're at Burning Man, and my wife is there, and there's this guy Sam, who's an amazing dude who we met at Burning Man, built a legendary friendship with, still connected with him now. And he said something so profound to my wife. Here's what he said: Tatiana's freaking out. We got to get somewhere. She's like, we got to get to the dance. We got to get to the dance. We're going to be late. And then Sam just pauses for a minute and he looks at Tatiana and he goes, Tatiana, this is the dance. Hmm. And I was like, yes. Dude, all of it, the chaos, the getting on your bikes, the running late, the doing this, the all of it, man, that's the dance. Everything is the dance. This life is the dance. And that to me has brought so much joy to me because then it lightens stuff up. When I start to th- take things too serious, I was like, John, just be in flow, man. Let's just dance with this. Whatever comes our way, whatever chant, let's just dance with it. You know, Mike, you got some rain coming your way. Sometimes you just got to dance in the rain. Oh, you know, it's here. That's it. It's, here. <laughs> <laughs> it's upon you. It's upon you. There's a foot of it. It's crashing through your door. <laughs> we are dancing. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for that. That's awesome. B- Biggs, let me toss it to you because uh, that was that was a great response. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I mean, I love the energy that you bring and also just the flow and the feel, like how you feel into things. Like I can sense you've done a lot of inner work and deeper work. And <clears throat> that's also a part of what you do, right? In leading dads, you obviously help them with sure. their businesses, you help them with their families, but you also help them energetically and connect with themselves and connect with the brotherhood and, and create spaces totally. for them to be able to explore parts of themselves that maybe they don't feel safe to explore or know how to explore outside of contexts like that. So I'm curious in your work with front row dads, what are some of the biggest challenges that you've seen 
modern men facing yeah. and what is it that front row dads does for them that you've witnessed kind of these beautiful moments inside that community. Yeah. So I'll, I'll keep this, yeah, I'll keep this simple and then we can dig where you want, but in, in mm-hmm. simple terms, it's how do you get it all done? Mm-hmm. Like every guy, the guy struggles, like, how do you get it all done? How do you go crush it at work, show up for your family, take care of your health, pay all the bills, take care of the yard, do the thing, show up, call mom, call my sister, right? Be there for my friend. Like, how do I predict the future, <laughs> right? Protect my family. Right. Do, do I need, what do I need? Do I need self-defense? Do I need guns? Do I need to buy food? Do I, what do I do? Am I missing out on the crypto business? Ah, like what? You know, there's a lot. There's a lot to deal with. And if you're the leader of your family and there's so much on the line, there's people you know, that you need to feed and protect and all, it's a lot of pressure. How do you get it all done? Right? That's, a, that's the question. And I think where we help men is through good conversation, authentic conversation, through reflection, through looking within, and then being able to look at somebody else. Because Mike, Andrew, you guys have a breakthrough. That, be, that could become my breakthrough. Your clarity becomes my clarity. You tell a story. I can see myself in your story. I get, to, I get to share that wisdom because of our relatability and our relationship that we've built, our trust that we have. So here's what we do is we help men figure out what do they want. This is right, Ray Dalio's book, Principles. It's like, what do you want? What's true? And basically, what are you going to do about it? That, that's a great framework. What do you want? What do you want? Not what everybody else is telling you to do, but what do you want to do as a profession? What do you want to do with your family? Where do you want to take them on vacation? How do you want your schedule to look, right? What what is it that you want to create in your life? And a lot of men don't give themselves the time to figure that out. It's like the normal, it's a very common answer, by the way, to be like, I I don't really know. So many options. I'm paralyzed with possibilities. That's a very common place. But we respect it when we see it in others, that certainty of like, this is what I want. This is the type of ice cream I want to eat. This is what I want my family values to be. You know how many men struggle with their family values? They're like, value everything. Well, of course, you, have, you value lots of things. But what's the core? Who, who are you? Who is your family collectively? These require think moments to think, which is why our events are popular because a lot of guys are just so busy. They don't take the time They take the time for their business. They'll take a time to plan a board meeting. They'll take a time to plan their weeklies with their staffs, but they don't take the time to plan out family dinners or family vacations. That all just gets like, you know, I'll just show up and kind of wing it with when I'm in it. But, you know, we can help men to gain some clarity. What are their truths? What are their principles? What are our collective principles as a community? And then we get to hold each other accountable. So there is a little bit of like, man, we see another guy doing all this stuff with his family. We're like, yeah, I, 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 that's a good example. Now I need to show up a little bit more. See some picture of a guy throwing the ball with his kid. And I'm like, I'm going to do that today because I saw that and now I'm going to go do it. That's the benefit of a community. And, and it's a beautiful community at that. I, I've had the privilege of being a part of it since June of 2021. And I've been on the kind of, I wasn't in the front row. I was more on the sidelines watching you grow this beautiful community. And June, 2021, I'm like, screw it. I'm in, I'm, I'm in. I signed up. I'm like, I want to get in the front row with the front row dads. And it was just from, from that moment. I mean, Kevin Evers, he had a a medically complex child. So, so did I, I was able to connect with him and he helped me when I needed someone the most. You and I had an exchange, which was extremely helpful. And then I, you, you, we created our band and the band has been unbelievable. I got my three new brothers now with Steven, Adam and, and, um, and Matt, Stephen, Adam, Matt, those three guys are fantastic. I did a real estate cash flow deal with Adam. We're helping Matt with some of his business systems, just like these brothers that we all have each other's back. This community is incredible. Uh, we had Ben Pakulski on the podcast because of Front Row Dads. We're interviewing Grant Baldwin tomorrow because of Front Row Dads. I mean, it is absolutely a remarkable group of men that you said it perfectly that, that you even created this group, if I'm not mistaken, because it's like, I didn't have all the answers. I, I just wanted to learn from <laughs> all right. these other really good dudes <laughs> and I could give that. That's exactly testimony. right. It's so, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing what you've built and what you created. So I just want to acknowledge that and just give my personal testimony to anyone who's listening. Uh, def- we usually wait till the end to say, Hey, go check out, you know, the call to action, but I'm here to tell you front row dads, 
if you're uh, if you're a dad, you want to have a family, or you have a family, you got to check out this community. It's been uh, it's been uh, I I don't even want to say amazing because it's such an overused word, but I would say it's been extremely helpful, valuable uh, for me to see how these men live their lives and lead their lives. Um, it's it, that's not something I've experienced in my life before. So I just want to thank you for that for sure. Thanks, man. Well, I appreciate you saying that. That is fuel for my soul. It's what keeps it going. Because if we didn't have that, uh, I, I would find it very difficult to do this work if we didn't have people saying what you just said. Uh, that is the fuel. You know, mm. So thank you. An amazing, amazing you know, framework there, John, to think about like, hey, how do I get it all done? Right? Because I think as a dad, Mike's a dad, you're a dad. <clears throat> that is exactly the question that subconsciously is running me all the time now that I think about it. It's like, how do I get it all done? How do I get it all done? How do I get it all done? And no matter what you do, you feel like you should be somewhere else. <laughs> you know, it's like, if I spend too much time at business. I should be with my family. If I'm at family, I should be spending totally. more time in business. Why didn't I hit the gym yesterday? Why, well, you know, did I get enough water? You know, you, you get a great example. Am I missing out on crypto? <laughs> it's like, yes, but all of these things are, are weighing on us constantly. And, um, and so you mentioned authentic conversation. Like it sounds like kind of like creating spaces for this. Yeah. When someone doesn't have community, when someone doesn't have spaces, uh, like this, like a dad's trying to do it on their own. What's the consequence of that? Like, what is it that, what are the challenges that you think this man runs into uh, well, in a modern context? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's such an interesting question because what, what I go to, I mean, my here's where my heart went immediately. I mean, it went to the fact like talking to this guy um, months ago, right? Former uh, special ops guy, special forces guy, military retired vet. And we did a, we did a healing ceremony together. It was a very small group and he was there and I met him for the first time and he, in his shares with me, um, and I'm not revealing anything that wouldn't be okay because I'm not telling you who it is. And you know, like this is, this is, this is not, this is knowledge that other people have, of course, in his, in his, um, uh, platoon or whatever he had called it, right. In his, in his group of men that he was connected to of 130, 32 of them committed suicide. So 130 men in his community, 30 of them committed suicide. Like if you just let that settle for a second, that is unbelievable to even hear heartbreaking at the core. And what happens is he said, John, he goes, you know, imagine this, like one minute you're fast roping out of helicopters. You're part of a brotherhood. It's clear direction, what you need to do every day. You have a system, you have a routine, you, everybody gets each other's backs. Like you are tight. You have a mission. You have part, like all of it, right? It's exciting. The adrenaline, the training, the physical, all of it. And then just like that, just like that, it's over. Everybody go home. No mission, no job, no purpose, no brothers, right? Everybody goes back to their lives, to their families. There's no structure. There's no catch. There's no net to catch you in. There's no like, by the way, when you're done with this, we got this group over here that we're going to transport you to, which is going to be phase two. This is your uh, integration. This is your, right? This, that, that doesn't exist. And I think that the, you know, what we see is we see depression. Um, we see men who are snapping. They don't have an outlet. They're just pushing it all down. They're just numbing it out with alcohol and, and drugs and, and gambling and sex and whatever else can, can numb out the pain. And you're just dealing with it. And when you don't have a place to just be witnessed, to be seen, to just not hold that in, where you can just be like, this is what I'm going through. And somebody is like, we got you, right? Who's got your back? That I think is uh, what you'll see is depression and at the worst, you know, arguably, you know, suicide. Mm. Um, and that's, that's somebody who's out of options and mm. that's the best route that they feel they can take. And that's tragic to me. So I want to create a community of men where they can feel seen and witnessed, right? So many men are dealing with the, I'm not enough. So I can't tell you how many times when you get to the core of it, there's this little kid right? And there's always a story and it was there for me too. Right. And it's like, I'm not enough. Mm. I do. Yeah. I have what it takes. It's a core for a lot of men. Dr. Kelly Flanagan was on the show and he talked mm. about the little one inside of us and that, that totally. listener, 
go back to that episode, read his book, Lovable. It was so, so, so profound. And um, I, I, I really, deal. oh, he's unreal, unreal. And I love that, again, another front row dad met, met in the community. Um, I, I wanted to take it back to, because you mentioned these men that don't have the structure. And, and let's say there is someone that's dealing with what you're talking about. They Maybe they left a previous chapter of life. Maybe it was a divorce or maybe they wasn't military or maybe something. And they're having these, maybe it's not suicidal thoughts, but these lower energetic frequencies that's coming into their mind. Uh, what um what could add some structure to their family? I know there's the family boardroom, um, uh, that the book uh, I think it's called the family sure. boardroom meeting, and we had uh, Mike McCarthy. I know talked at one of the summits. It's a good and, one, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's lots of great content that you've had in the community. Could you speak to our our listeners just a little bit about your favorite you know setup for the family boardroom? How you talk to uh, Ocean or Tiger, and how you bring some of those conversation table topics? Sure. You know. And you, how you and Tatiana yeah. like facilitate some of practical that practical applications. Yeah, yeah. Practical applications. Yeah. That'd be well, really you, helpful. You, you said it, it's great. The miracle morning for parents and families is a great, you know, it, there's a workbook that goes along with that too. And I think that's a great place to start. Um, you know, Mike McCarthy, by the way, quick plug for an opportunity for men to get connected. Cause I think no, nothing's greater than in person. We've got an event December 2nd through the 4th. And that is an opportunity for men to not be in isolation, to show up because look, it's great to do video chats and it's great to do the online stuff. If that's the best option you got, you should do it. But the best option is to be in person with somebody that nothing's going to beat that. So Mike will be at that event talking about the miracle morning for parents and families, which would be great. Um, <clears throat> I'll share with you, you know, well, l- let me also touch on what you said, because I want to close that loop. So Jim Shields was at our very first ever Front Row Dad retreat, and he taught the family board meeting. It's a quick read. The book must be like 80 or 90 pages. Like it's a it's a 40 minute read. It's beautiful. But it's a really cool story. And if you don't want to get the book, here's the deal. Um, he's in Florida, massively successful real estate guy, has kids, wants to spend time with them. And he's a surfer. So the family board meeting became this play on like, he had all these business board meetings, but he wanted to be out on the surfboard with his kids. So he decided to take time four hours every quarter with each kid, like a board meeting where it would be one-on-one and no technology and just connecting, right? And a little debrief at the end. And it became this ritual. He calls it rhythms, right? So great surfer terminology there, these rhythms, mm. right? And, and, uh, and our guys just grabbed a hold of this and they started doing them. And then to this day, man, we still talk about the family board meeting, right? And, 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 and guys have this now ritual that brings them con- you know, in connection with their kids. All right. So there's all these ideas and resources and structures that are very powerful for people. Another guy, Rich Christensen, who we just had on the podcast and will also be with us in Austin, December 2nd, he has built many multi-million dollar businesses, <clears throat> very successful. And he, but the thing that he's most proud of is like raising five boys that are all these incredible kids that now adults. And he talked about his rite of passage program, what he did at eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, 14, 16, and 18 to send them off into the world. And it's, it's, amazing. He put all that together in something called the Legato um, family. What was it? What, what, Legato. Oh, I'm missing the last name of it. Legato. If you look it up, Rich Christensen, you'll get to it. But anyway, um, and him and his son, Matthew, are going to be at the conference talking about their father-son relationship because his son, Matthew, by the way, in his own in his 20s, built and sold a company and basically is set for life. And so they're talking about all the things that he learned from his dad and their relationship. It's just a really great story. But let me bring it back to something really practical for you, Mike. So some of those are big. Some of those are like journeys that you'll need to go on. But let me give you something you could do this week. So something I started doing a couple of years ago that a lot of guys have, have told me they implemented and it's been effective is that I just print out a picture, you know, occasionally right on my printer like my couple hundred dollar printer over here. I buy four by six Canon printer paper off Amazon, throw it in the printer. I print a picture and it's a picture of my kids doing something. And I'm always snapping pictures as a lot of people are, right? Random stuff They're you know, whatever. But now I take them a little more intentionally because what I do is I print the picture and I write a note on the back and I write a note about what they're doing that week that I'm recognizing as a strength, a talent, an effort that I want to bring attention to. So I write a little note on the back and then I put it in a photo album. And I was just looking to see, I have the photo albums downstairs right now, but 
it's interesting. I couldn't have planned this any better, but look, sitting right on my desk are the pictures I printed for this week. So there's me and Tiger, <clears throat> and this is at a concert that we went to. And I just wanted to tell him how great it was to spend time with him, how fun it is to be in his presence. So I haven't written the note yet, but I, written the note yet, but I'll flip it over. I'll take a, a Sharpie marker, a fine point Sharpie. And this is another one of my son, Ocean, <clears throat> who's playing on the porch with his friend, Razi, right? And they're, they're putting a Lego set together. And I'm going to talk to him about how great of a friend he is to his buddy, Razi. And so I have, let's call it hundreds of these pictures mm -hmm. with notes on the back. Mm -hmm. And I've got them in an album. So I'll take the picture, by the way, I'll write the note and then I'll take a picture of the note in case anything ever happened to the physical picture. But my imagination tells me that uh, my kids will, will want to, at one point when they're adults, look back and say, who was I as a child? What came natural to me? A question that I think a lot of men want to know when you get to a certain age in life and you're conscious enough, you're like, who am I at my core before the world got a hold of me? Before I started all this, before the blueprints, you know, before the programming, before the commercials, before the ads, before the trauma, before the, right? All of that, before the world told me who I was, who am I at my core? And when you're a child, a lot of that shows up naturally. So mm. I, I hope that these are beautiful gifts for my kids. And, uh, you know, I occasionally do it for my wife too. I'll, I'll print out a picture. I'll, I'll do that. And then if we have people come to my house, by the way, just as like guests that come over for coffee, tea, sauna, dinner, whatever, I'll snap a picture of them like playing with my kids. I'll run upstairs real quick and I'll write them a note. But then what I'll do is I'll give them the note in front of my kids because what I want my kids to see me doing is loving and honoring other people. Because I feel like if my kids watch me notice the strengths in others and honor the strengths in others, that's one of the greatest gifts that I will give them is to be a person that, that reflects the light back to somebody that, that sees genius in people and then can express it to them. Because if they can do that, they can build community. And if they can build community, they'll always be okay because community is the greatest survival tool. Mm. Yeah. I remember you hearing you say something like that on your, one of your podcasts that you do your miracle morning, but it's before the kids wake up. So you try to like, do it a little bit of the miracle morning so they can watch you and practice. Let your kids catch you reading. Let your kids catch you meditating. Let your kids catch you journaling, right? Mm. Yeah. You can't or, do it. I mean, it's, it's good yeah. to prep yourself before your kids, but if they never see you do any of that stuff, that's also <laughs> not good. Yeah. Mm. Or, or if it's my household climbing on my neck as I'm meditating and, uh, you know, yeah, that's and what a gift from the universe, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Oh, you think you can hold your focus? Here you go. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. Uh, what I, what I love about almost everything you've said so far, John, is like, there's a, there's a level of intentionality to what you're bringing. There's so totally. much focus and intentionality. And I think, you know, that's a very masculine trait that you're bringing. And I think a lot of men, <clears throat> you know, um, in a modern context with the messaging of toxic masculinity and then, you know, how that plays with modern feminism and, and all these different things. Um, do we have a dark side? Of course, but, you know, we've also been beaten down quite a bit as men. Um, uh, we've sometimes surrendered that, right? And the household has uh, uh, sometimes, I, I think, if we were to maybe look at the average or the median household, uh, the, it's mostly a happy wife, happy life scenario where it's just like, whatever you want, honey, where do you want to go to dinner? What do you want to do? Um, if you want to go send the kids to that school, great. I don't care. A lot of dads are checked out, right? Yeah. Um, and you are you are modeling the exact opposite of that. And so how did you, you know, I don't know if that just comes naturally to you or if you have to work at that. But, you know, for, for men who maybe have fallen into that trap of checking out uh, to step in and say, no, this is the direction for my family. These are our values. I'm going to make these special totally. moments. Like, how do they do that? So, man, it, I might get a little fired up here because you're touching on something that I have a lot of energy around. So right now, I just brought up on my computer, Google search engine, and I type in dad, and then I hit a space bar, right? What is, what is Google telling me that people are looking for? What is the world searching for? And this... I don't know if I can curse on your show, but this, if I'm going to curse, this is what I'm going to do. Fire away, dude. I love you all the time. <laughs> so well, here's the thing. Dad jokes. Dad jokes 2022. Dad bod. Dad joke of the day. Dad jokes for kids. Dad gifts, dad shoes, dad grass, dad hat, 
Dad jokes Reddit. What in the fuck? Dude, that is liter that's an embarrassment in my opinion. Like our we have we have taken the dad role and we've made it uncool. We've made it a joke, right? If it, it, it's like we've made them in our in our TV series, in our in our advertisements and the way that we speak about dads, dads can't they don't know how to dress. They got a dad bot. Like it's everything's falling apart. They're bumbling idiots. They can't like that is that is exactly the thing we want to fight against, right? We want so that if somebody was actually wearing any type of shirt that had the word dad on it, that'd be something they'd be proud of, not embarrassed by, right? This role that we've minimized its importance. And I think you're right about this piece of masculinity that's very important for people to look at. Look, anything can become toxic in many ways, right? Anything um, in extremes can become toxic, but who you are at your core, energetically, at your best, right? When you are showing up for your family, when you are delivering from a place of certainty, Right. And that balance of confidence and humility is so important. You need to be able to say, this is the direction we're going in. This is the rule in our house. This is how much screens you're allowed to have. That's not how you talk to your mother. This is how Romans operate. This, that, that, is, that comes with certainty, right? Of who you are. And that's power that's important and curiosity. And so it's a, it's a, that's a masculine and feminine energy. That's an alpha and omega. That's a, this and that, that is a dance that needs to exist. We are born in a world of polarity, magnetic poles, things that pull and repel and a dance that goes back and forth. And we need all of that to show up. We need people that are in their feminine and in their masculine. And by the way, we all have it. I know what my feminine is. It's, it's open, it's free, it's loving, it's dancing. I need to be able to tap that. I want to expand my edges. I want to push further into understanding my feminine and feminine flow and what feminine energy does for me. And, and when, when, when I look at a woman who's totally feminine, how that lights me up inside, not even that I have to want to sleep with her, but that I just recognize feminine energy at its best. And I'm like, yes, right? And then this masculine energy of driving and creating and achieving. And if you look at the thousands of years that have come before us, the hunter and the gatherer and just... And by the way, anybody can be anybody they want. There are men with more feminine energy. There are women with more masculine energy. I'm not getting into a conversation about what gender you choose to be or any of that. I'm saying that there are people who show up and there are people where they do it with certainty and that men, right, in your core, ask yourself, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a leader in my family? And then look around the world and just see how we've made a mockery of some of these decisions that men need to be making. And by the way, women, when they're in their feminine, respond so powerfully to a man who is certain, who can make decisions, who can drive forward. And it's not about dominance. It's not about dismissing the feminine, right? This is about a partnership and a flow. And what I really want more than anything for men, for dads, is to redefine what that looks like moving forward right now and to own it for yourself and create a brand for yourself and your family and the men that are around you. And that's exactly what Front Row Dads wants to do. Take this bullshit Google search and then someday in the near future, maybe it's like dad wisdom, right? Dad legends, right? Dad strategies, whatever people searching for this, this, this father that has a place in our world to guide and lead and, and show love and respect and be all of that, that they are born to be. Mm. Preach, brother. Preach. I mean, this is Sorry, amazing. Yeah, well, that's and, soapbox uh, for me. <laughs> no, I, I love it. And I mean, I, I never thought to look at the, the Google search terms of what that is, but the fact that it's not actually surprising you know, to hear those terms, dad joke, right? Uh, like, and literally, dads are a joke in the society. If you watch any sort of show, they're always kind of the butt of the joke. And, um, and it's like, yeah, let's reclaim that back. Let's, let's show what dads are really supposed to be because – Quite frankly, especially if you look at the statistics, I mean, when a dad's in the home and he's engaged versus when a dad's not in the home, whew, man, major outcome differences in terms of the their life, uh, you know, the outcomes and the success rates and in uh, all sorts of different metrics. So, um, Mike, I know you had a question. Where did you want to yeah, lead to next? I, I just wanted to, before we head to the exits, John, I, you, you have um, this beautiful soul in your life, Tatiana. 
uh, that is that is your worthy opponent on this journey of life. That your partner, your your um, person that challenges you, that that makes you better. And I love the section in your book. What? Uh, and, and I also <laughs> and I also love the you know just following you on social media, just everything that she she offers to you in this journey of becoming a better man. So I, yeah. my two part question is number one is if you could share the ver- the story, like how you attracted her into your life, that you were looking for a roommate. I really love that story, if you could just capture it. But I also want you to kind of take our audience, because there might be people listening to us. We have female men listening to this, this experience on how that crazy encounter of a roommate becoming your soulmate, leading you down this path to who you are now, and how this rock star of a, of a woman in your life and this partner has helped you mold into this version of you versus that version of you yeah. then. If you could at least speak to that and then we'll head for the exits, that would be really awesome. Yeah. There's a there's a Ram Das quote that says, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your family. <laughs> you ever heard that? <laughs> and it's like you ask people enough, you're like, which relationship in your life just challenges you the most? If there's somebody that can get to you, that can get under your skin, that can just poke you in all the wrong places, it's your intimate partner. You know, that's, that's the one that will get you more than anybody. Um, and of course it's, everybody has an interesting dynamic and some seem more severe than others when it comes to like the level of friction that can be created and fire in that relationship. But to, to speak to your point, so yeah, going back to 2005, six, um, Tatiana and I, uh, we're both in New Jersey and I had just broken up long-term relationship, place an ad on roommates.com. And Tatiana answered that ad and she moved in. And when I first met her, I was like, Oh Lord, like I'm in trouble. But I was like, I, I'm a gentleman. I can keep my hands to myself. Like I'm not going to stalk her in the kitchen. It's going to be fine. But about four weeks into the, her living there, we went to go see a concert together and it was just so obvious. The mag, it was magnetic. I mean, it was, there was nothing that was going to stop it from happening. And sure enough, like, yeah, a year later we're engaged and then uh, six months after that, we're married. And nine months after our wedding day, Tiger shows up. And so we're living in New Jersey. Then we venture to Virginia Beach. We move back to New Jersey. We end up in Austin, Texas seven years ago. And uh, my relationship with her has been the most challenging part of my entire life, I would say. And I say that with all the respect to her, I'm not saying she is the most challenging person. I'm saying that I am challenged by being in a relationship with her because, uh, you know, you've heard the saying, like, we marry our unfinished business. Like, in many ways, we marry the exact person that is needed to, like, push you and challenge you. Because if we can select that person consciously, we are saying, I need this person to help me evolve into the person I know I was born to be. And, and at a very internal level, even if we can't articulate it and we can't logically reason through it, you've selected that person because they are there to challenge you and push you and elevate you. And if you stay in that, and you accept that and you move on. And I know that there's all sorts of exceptions to these rules. So anybody could poke holes in this. Like if somebody's beating you, if somebody, like there's all rules when you go, look, this is, our agreement is off, right? I'm not saying that you should stay around and be abused by somebody, but I'm saying challenged by somebody in a healthy way that can sometimes feel like it's going to break you, can push you into, can call you up into the best version of yourself. And that is what continually happens with Tatiana. I can't tell you how many times I thought we were going to get divorced. I literally am like, it's done. I'm 100% sure it's done. We're getting divorced. It's over. And by the way, that still might happen. Somebody might call me up and sick, you know, 12 months from now. And they're like, you said it was like, you know, and now you're, it's like, I don't know what the future holds guys. I really don't. But I know this. I don't own Tatiana. I don't own her. I'm in an agreement with her. I'm in a partnership with her. And every day you're, you're stepping into that partnership and you're, and you're moving forward together. We are committed to each other. And right now we're in a season of massive growth together. And it's awesome. She's growing. I'm growing. We're learning constantly. And she, but she is somebody that does not mess around 
when it comes to like her directness too. I mean, there, I, she has very many, she has different archetypes and one of them I call the Russian assassin. And that is the woman who said, you're more of a moment maker for everybody else than you are for our family. That's the woman who 30 days ago said, I'm, I'm not attracted to you when you're acting like a whiny bitch. This is the woman <laughs> that is calling me up. And by the way, is beautifully feminine and dances and floats like a butterfly. And I'm drawn to her like a moth to a flame. It's beautiful. We have an incredible energy in our relationship and it's incredibly challenging uh, that, that's the truth that's what i wanted to hear brother and that's uh <laughs> self that was selfishly for me but I, I i'm glad all of our listeners got to hear that because uh that that is the dance that many of us men also that's go through and um we don't necessarily know how to contextualize it as beautiful as you just did so thank you mm-hmm. for that gift and thank you for clarifying that uh for our audience bigs if you want to uh Take us uh, to the final three questions uh, uh, of the episode, uh, and then we could uh, let, I I know John has, I know you already mentioned the event. I'd love for you to give us a little bit more uh, context of of the Front Row Dad event and where they can find more information about Front Row Dad. So Biggs, why don't you uh, kick off the questions? So, So John, we always ask our podcast guests three questions. The first is, what do you think the world needs most right now? So the world needs to dance. You know, I'm sticking with my theme. The world needs... Um, inner work. Each individual needs to understand their energy and how it how it connects and collaborates with other people's energy. And we need to, um, you know, stop fighting and start dancing a little a little bit more. Great. And what would you say is like one to three books that everyone needs to read besides the front row factor? Uh, well, uh, thank you. I received that and very kind. Um, Yeah. What I would say, if I look at my world right now, I'm going to answer it from what's relevant in this moment. Uh, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, however you pronounce his last name. You know, that is to me, I'm listening to that with my 13 year old in the car right now. And the simplicity of those principles, right, I think are very important. So um, be impeccable with your word and don't take things personally. These are like, timeless principles that I think we could all benefit from. I, I love that book. I actually wanted to share that with Tiger because when I asked this myself the question, what 10 books do I really hope that he is exposed to before he leaves home? The Four Agreements was was one of those books. Um, I got to give some love to my buddy Hal. Uh, p- probably a bunch of people have already read it, but I think it's worthy to note that The Miracle Morning is a great book and there's a reason that it's it's a, it's a global phenomenon it, it, because it works because he did a great job with a simple concept of giving to yourself before you give to the day. And I, mm. I just think that's that if you want to shrug your shoulders and be like, really, you want me to read a book that tells me to wake up and read and meditate? Like, got it. But he's a great storyteller. It's a, it's a cool book. And I think it's worth reading and rereading. And then one more, because it was relevant to our conversation today. The Way of the Superior Man by David Data is a polarizing book. There is some shit in that book that when you listen, you might be like, what did John tell me to listen to? This is crazy. But that's exactly why I think that you should listen to it is it's a test. You don't have to take everything from the book. You don't have to take it literally. But but from a but sometimes those who choose to speak courageously and say things that others aren't willing to say is exactly what we needed to hear right to where we might need to get a little offended we might need to get our feathers ruffled a little bit we might need to consider an extreme opinion if you will and then from that you take what you want and you ask what's true and how it applies to your life but but no doubt that book has some compelling ideas around um, what it looks like to be a man engaging with a woman or masculine and feminine energy, Mm. if you put it at that. I think that for me, that's very relevant right now and very interesting right now. Um, So there you go. We we love that book. We're big proponents of it. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's amazing. Yeah. So the final question is, uh, what, what does it mean to you to be better than rich? You know, to me, what what I feel when I hear that is that if I can find the richness within me, right, the richness in the moment, um, to me, the richness is in the is in the full taste of the moment, right? It's like something that's like you fully embody this moment, 
and and the better than rich is like just progress. It's just improvement. Can you can you just be a little better today than you were yesterday? So can you find the richness within each moment, and then can you can you learn to just move forward with that, and uh, and and believe that you are an evolving being. And <clears throat> some days that will feel more obvious than others, and some days it feels like you're just taking kicks to the teeth. But if you can stay in the belief that your spirit, that your energy, that your being is evolving, and that our job is to be consciously aware of that and play with that and dance with that, I think that's the best we can do. It's awesome. It's a great answer. And uh, this was all. This was so beneficial, John. I, I, I selfishly, again, I really appreciate this conversation. Can you uh, can you in, inform our audience on Front Row Dads <laughs> and the Front Row uh, Dad Live, the uh, the event that's coming yeah. up? Uh, so that way they can get a little bit of context if they're available that December weekend, you know, just give us a little bit of a rundown of what we could expect from that. Yeah. If you want to be a better dad, come to Austin. Like that's my ask. Um, beyond that, if you resonate with the statement, you know, family men with businesses, not businessmen with families, that's also like a, Hey, this might be the universe nudging you to be like, that's your group. <clears throat> if you, um, look, some people will challenge it. go, uh, if I want to be a better dad, shouldn't I just stay at home <laughs> with my kids? And I'm like, look, if everything's going perfect at home, then yeah, stay there. <laughs> but if you have, if you have some awareness of some challenges, or if you have some awareness that things might be better, or even if you believe in blind spots, like so much of, we don't even know what we don't know. So you might go to the event, you don't even know where you need help, but you meet somebody and you see what they're doing. You're like, oh, that's what it could look like. Then, yeah, you might have some uh, exposure to your blind spots revealed at that event. I, I would say this is, a, this is a group, this is an event for men who believe in personal growth. And if they value that for their business, then the question is, do you value that for your family? Mm -hmm. Like if you'll take time out to sharpen your ax for your business, why would you think that you're born a perfect dad or a perfect husband or a perfect family man? Like, don't you need the same level of attention and interest in that? Could they bring their so that's family why we have the event. event. Could they bring their family to the no. event? No, no, I don't. I do not look. They guys can travel with their families wherever the fuck they want because <laughs> because that's right. You get to do whatever you want. But at our event, my my strong encouragement is not have your family there because what you need is distance. Because sometimes what we need is to step away from all of our triggers, from all of our habits. And that's why even traveling out of town is the best option. And even guys that are in Austin, my recommendation is to stay at the hotel and not go home. Because mm -hmm. you go home and you can get into a fight with your wife and it throws you off and you bring that energy into the event the next day. But if you can give yourself space, that's the key. It's space, right? To see what emerges. And the question is, like, are you worth finding out if this event could help you? Is your family worth you know, a couple days and 1500 bucks to go check it out. And if it is, then great. Is this event for everybody? Definitely not. But it is for high performing, hard charging, entrepreneurial minded people who want to surround themselves with other people like that. And dude, listen to this. I've been hosting the Front Row Dad podcast for years and years and years. And I've asked many people, hey, when you think of a legendary dad, a dad who's just like, just killing it, who comes to mind? I can't tell you how many times people got stumped by that question. Listen, to, like, do you hear that? How many times people are like, I, I don't, nobody comes to mind. I'm like, what? Nobody comes to mind? Dude, imagine having 150 people that come to mind. This event sells out at 150 people. Imagine being in a room of 150 people who are all like, yeah, my family's worth it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna take three days to grow as a dude. Like, imagine being around that group of guys. Mm. Um, that is our goal. And the thing is, I'm not the teacher of everything. Dude, we got Hal Elrod kicking it off, right? We've got my buddy Preston Smiles, who's legend in the coaching business. And, you know, he's got four kids under five years old. This is crazy. Four kids under five years old. Like, how is he doing it all? Um, you know, we've got incredible people that are going to be in attendance. Rich Christensen and his son, Matthew, are going to be there. We're going to interview them, you know, about their father-son, write a passage journey. There's going to be incredible talks on psychedelics with my buddy, Tucker Max. We're going to be talking about sex. We're going to be talking about wealth with my friend, Justin Donald, lifestyle investor, and his business partner, Eric Van Horn. These guys are legends in the investment space. And they're going to be there talking. Like, it is literally a lineup of absolute rock stars of men who've killed it in all every different areas of business and in life and want to be family men first. 
So if that sounds and, good. And where, yeah, where do they go? If they want to sign up, they're, they're like, I'm in. Where, where do I go to find out? Frontroadads.com. Frontroadads.com. The, 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 the shortcut is frontroadads.com slash live. We'll get you there directly, but right on our website. It's on the homepage. It's mm-hmm. frontroadads.com. And um, yeah. And, and if you want to go hear more about it, we'll be talking about it on the podcast, Front Road Ads podcast. And, you know, but guys, I, I really appreciate you having me on to talk about these things, to bring attention and light to this subject of fatherhood and leading at home and leading in our families. Uh, and I also want to give so much love to the, to the amazing moms out there and being a, you know, front row dad is a man who respects and treats his wife like a queen and shows his kids how to treat a woman, how to treat his partner, how to treat their spouse. So I want to honor all the men who are lifting up their families, who are building them up and it's hard and you'll get triggered and you'll be angry at your wife and your children and you won't like them at times, but you know, surround yourself with men so that you can have somebody to talk to, that you can get some new strategies because dude, it is hard. Nothing has been harder in my life. And I've run ultra marathons, built businesses and charities and all that stuff. The hardest thing I've ever done is to be a great husband and a great dad. It is the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. And, and in some cases, the easiest thing, cause you go, oh, I just love them. But I I'd like to think that there's a little more to it than just loving them, mm-hmm. you know? And so, um, yeah. Um, props to all the, the women, props to all the men, and props to all the kids who are being patient as their parents learn how to be parents. It's awesome, John. Well, thank you so much again for your time. And uh, we're excited to you know just continue the, the Front Road Dad partnership wherever we can. We also had Justin Donnell on the show. So it's our first episode of season, uh, second episode of season three. So uh, anyone who wants to learn more about Justin Donald can go to that episode and then learn more even at the, the Front Road Dad Summit. So uh, again, thank you for your time. Andrew, thank you for your time. And listener, thank you for your time. And listener, assuming this episode helped you, it's your turn to help others by sharing this with a friend. Subscribe on YouTube, leave a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. And always remember, leave today better than you found it. Till next time. What's up, guys? Biggs here. I hope you enjoyed that clip. Uh, if you did, go ahead and check out the other video that's being recommended on the screen right now. You can also subscribe to our channel. And then if you really are interested in what we do, go to automatedelegatesystemize.com to learn more about what we're up to. Thanks again.